Day, Karnak time. George Bush, May the Turkey, and Flower the Turkey. George Bush, May the Turkey, and Flower the Turkey. Name three creatures who will eventually all need pardons. All that and more now on Countdown. Good evening, this is Tuesday, November 20th, 350 days until the 2008 presidential election. Scott McClellan today not only accused the President of the United States and the Vice President and Karl Rove of being, quote, involved, unquote, in lying to the American public about who outed CIA operative Valerie Plame, but he also by implication accused the President of the United States of commuting the sentence of Scooter Libby, even though some of Libby's lies to the grand jury were lies in which Mr. Bush was, quote, involved. Our fifth story on the countdown, his publisher is releasing the briefest of excerpts from McClellan's upcoming book, but those 121 words portray President Bush as, at best, a passively involved liar-in-chief. The timing of the release of the McClellan excerpt, flapping with irony, having commuted Mr. Libby's sentence for his role in the scandal earlier this year, this morning it was time for the annual pre-Thanksgiving commuting of the turkeys at the White House. Same effect as a pardon, so that's what Countdown is going to call the photo op for the rest of the Bush administration. The president's former press secretary, in an excerpt of his upcoming book, What Happened, posted on the website of its publisher, recalls the time he spent stonewalling and lying, he says unknowingly, about the involvement of top White House officials in that leak. Quote, the most powerful leader in the world had called upon me to speak on his behalf and help restore credibility he'd lost amid the failure to find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So I stood at the White House briefing room, podium, in front of the glare of the Klieg lights for the better part of two weeks and publicly exonerated two of the senior most aides in the White House, Carl Rove and Scooter Libby. There was one problem. It was not true. I had unknowingly passed along false information, and five of the highest ranking officials in the administration were involved in my doing so. Rove, Libby, the vice president, the president's chief of staff, and the president himself. A lot to get here on this. John Dean on how smoking this gun is and what use it may be towards establishing, inevitably, what did the president know and when did he know it. Eugene Robinson on who, if anybody in politics, will pick this up and run with it. And let's start with our MSNBC correspondent, David Schuster, who has covered the CIA leak scandal for us since its beginning. David, good evening. Good evening, Keith. If not the first time that President Bush has been implicated in this, is this the first time and the most direct link has been um, offered by anybody who was a principal who would have known what was going on? Yes, it's the most direct link of President Bush to the public lies told by the White House. And you have to remember, Keith, that at the time that Scott McClellan was denying that Carl Rove and Scooter Libby had been involved in leaking classified information, McClellan had reason to be suspicious about both. He first cleared Carl Rove, and then Vice President Cheney demanded that Scott McClellan publicly clear Scooter Libby. And the trial evidence from Scooter Libby's trial produced evidence that, in fact, Vice President Cheney wrote out talking points for Scott McClellan to clear Scooter Libby. The key question in all of this is what kind of conversation did McClellan have with President Bush? Did McClellan say, you know, I'm a little worried about this, and the president said, hey, the vice president wants you to do this, go ahead and do it, or the chief of staff wants you to do it, or Carl Rove wants you to do it. But the Libby trial evidence, Keith, again, this is not the first time that it has shown that President Bush was involved. The Libby trial produced evidence that President Bush, in June of 2003, was interested, according to Scooter Libby's grand jury testimony, in the very first New York Times column that mentioned the possibility of problems with the State of the Union speech and mentioned that an unnamed ambassador had undermined the State of the Union because of a previous trip to the government of Niger. And then in July... According to the Scooter Libby testimony, July of 2003, Vice President Cheney asked Scooter Libby to leak classified information to New York Times reporter Judy Miller and that Cheney was doing so at the behest of President Bush. So you've got two instances already of the president being involved in the strategy and now, of course, you've got evidence of the president being directly involved in the cover-up on the eve of the criminal investigation and at a time when the public knew that there was a criminal investigation and there was Scott McClellan saying nobody in the White House was involved. The two-week period to which Mr. McClellan is clearly referring to in that excerpt, uh, September 2003, he told reporters that Carl Rove and Scooter Libby never leaked the identity of Valerie Plame and he also said that the president knows Mr. Rove was not involved. Does the timing of that excerpt and the nature of what he's written here raise the possibility that the president 
had known about Rove and Libby's involvement when he said, and it was September 30th of that year, 2003, the quote exactly was this, I don't know of anybody in my administration who leaked classified information. If somebody did leak classified information, I'd like to know it and we'll take the appropriate action. Did he, is there an indication that he knew that wasn't true, yet he kept on denying that he knew the identity of those who were involved? Yeah, there is every indication now that, in fact, the president knew that there had been people in his White House who had leaked classified information. And again, it gets back to Scott McClellan going to the president saying, you know what, I've got some concerns. What should I do? Should I publicly clear Carl Rove and Scooter Libby? At the time, of course, the Libby trial produced the evidence that Vice President Cheney knew that what Scott McClellan was doing was essentially going to be lying to the American public. Now, it's possible, even though Vice President Cheney and President Bush had conversations about the CIA leak case in the summer of 2003, it is possible that Vice President Cheney decided not to tell President Bush to try to distance the president from the lies and the strategy that Vice President Cheney and Scooter Libby were perpetrating on the American people and on the grand jury. And I suppose it's also possible, Keith, that if President Clinton said it depends on what the definition of is is, then maybe President Bush thought, well, it depends on what the definition of no is. <laughs> but clearly, this is why Scott McClellan's book, book is going to be so intriguing. All right, and from, from the intrigue and the parsing of it, what is the White House saying about this tonight, David? Well, the White House is suggesting that uh, President Bush was misled, just like Scott McClellan, that while Scott, Scott McClellan was misled by Carl Rove and Scooter Libby, so too was President Bush. So there you have the White House in the unusual position of trying to water down what Scott McClellan's publisher is putting out there. And yet, at the time that the White House is watering this down, you have a lot of people in Washington say, wait a second, when it comes to credibility, the people who are saying, oh, no, the president did this unwittingly, these are the same people who have such huge credibility problems, Keith, because of this very CIA leak case. MSNBC's David Schuster, and here we go again, the same old story coming back to get us. As always, great thanks, David. Thanks, Keith. For for more on the legal ramifications that might be gleaned from these 121 words, we turn now to Nixon White House Counsel John Dean, author of Broken Government, How Republican Rule Destroyed the Legislative, Executive, and Judicial Branches. As always, John, great thanks for your time tonight. Good evening, Keith. Is what Mr. McClellan describes hints at in this excerpt, could this be the framework of criminal conspiracy in the White House? Is there the possibility here that President Bush took part in a cover-up? Well, it's certainly it is pregnant with that possibility, uh, clearly. Uh, what you have here is what was conspicuously absent from Fitzgerald's investigation, or certainly anything in the indictments, was a conspiracy. And there is a very clear statute, uh, 371 of the Criminal Code, that says that two or more people get together to defraud the government. And this is a very sort of thing that could be defrauding the government by denying honest information to the government, uh, that that indeed is a very serious felony. So there indeed is the suggestion here. Can Fitzgerald reopen, or can somebody else reopen on his behalf, or is, is there a way for the White House to quash that? Well, uh, I, I, he, I understand his investigation is ongoing, that he has never formally closed it, uh, that he hasn't said that it's over, and, and, and he would probably have to impanel a new grand jury, but it certainly doesn't mean if he thinks he's been deceived, and if he thinks there's been an offense and a conspiracy that has been, uh, he's been somehow eluded from learning the true facts, I think he'd go for it. Have you had any success in finding precision in this excerpt? Because Scott McClellan has previously said he and Bush were misled in the same way. Did we just hear what David Schuster was reporting about the White House reaction tonight? Dana Perino said this. The publisher has said this. Uh, does that mean Bush was not there for the origin of the lie, but, but Cheney was, or Rove, or Libby, or Andy Card? Is there anything specific in this? Well, there's very little that's specific in this. I actually thought about calling the publisher today. Uh, he's a very able publisher, uh, Peter Osnos at Public Affairs, good journalist. He knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, but if he says there's not much more, and that's the indication, I think that's maybe why they put this out as a good tease to get bookstores interested in the book. Um, is there a straight line, do you think, or does this give us any better suggestion or throw any better light on whether or not there is a straight line from the, from, from the lie to McClellan or whoever originated that and Libby's lies to the grand jury? Well, I think David Schuster put it very well, that indeed there has been an implication of that line all along, and it's a question of whether what 
uh, what he adds next in this uh, very pregnant clause or, or few paragraphs he's put out in the book. Uh, it could well be a direct line. We just don't know at this point. But uh, to that point, David Gregory reporting earlier tonight from the White House that there's not going to be a retraction from McClellan, um, but it's also unlikely that the revelations would go any further. The phrase was the president, uh, the uh, former press secretary is not going to be taking a hatchet to the president. Is it nonetheless with this time for the, for the House Judiciary Committee to hold some sort of hearing and call Mr. McClellan as a witness and ask him publicly, what did you know? When did you know it? Not to mention what did the president know and when did he know it? Well, if, there were a situa if the situation were reversed and the Republicans were in control, you can be sure they would be running something like this down from the Clinton administration. But I don't know why that the Judiciary Committee couldn't make at least first an informal inquiry of McClellan's counsel. If, he get, if they get stiff-armed, just subpoena the manuscript and bring it in and decide whether it should go further. And I would be surprised if Conyers doesn't do something like that or Pat Leahy in the uh, Senate. Does this whole story here call the Libby commutation into question because of the point that I raised earlier that, that whoever started these lies, the lies to McClellan and the lies to the grand jury by Libby were on the same material, and, and here is a guy saying, I got this from within the White House. Is, a, is there the, the possibility that a commutation can be overridden in some way if a president were found to have been doing that for the purpose of protecting himself, or is the only um, avenue against him impeachment? Keith, this is about as plenty or plenty or area of power as a president has is is the power to pardon. Uh, a lot of peas in there. But anyway, uh, there's little that can be done after a president issues a pardon. And it's really not reviewable by anybody. Uh, it's not subject to uh, revocation. So it's a fact. It's it's going to stand. Last point, John, is there something in this for the for the Wilsons, for Joe and, and Valerie Plame Wilson to add? Uh, the president to the civil suit that they had filed against uh, Rove and Libby at Al, and, and might that be the, the route by which we finally get the absolute truth in this thing? That's a thin possibility. The case was dismissed on a jurisdictional base that the, the people involved were all immunized. Judge Bates said that even lying didn't seem to uh, trouble him, that they were acting beyond their scope of employment. Uh, we just don't know what this leads to, and it could well give them another opening. John Dean, White House Legal Counsel under Richard Nixon, author of Broken Government. Great thanks for your insight on this one, John. Thank you, Keith.